And Patricia Carvelis in the studio with us this week. Uh, PK, you just got back from Gama. I did. I did spend uh, really the weekend at Gama, northeast Arnhem Land for the ABC. And Gama is really the premier Indigenous event yeah. in the country. You know, the most high profile people go to this event. CEOs of companies, uh, Indigenous leaders, uh, ministers, shadow ministers. So it is that kind of event. We've been covering it extensively. Constitutional recognition was one of the issues that was highest on the agenda. But there were other issues too that I don't think necessarily got the, got the attention they deserved. One of them was a, a speech that was actually given by the Yothu Yindi Foundation CEO, Denise Bowden, where she talked about the fact that the NT government, she believes, is not investing in remote communities enough, mm -hmm. that some of the money that they receive, of course, with our Commonwealth uh, Territory arrangement, too much goes into Darwin or the, or the city rather than remote communities. That critique I thought was quite stinging and uh, I actually interviewed uh, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister on RM Breakfast this morning challenging her on this claim. They say that they are investing in remote communities so I thought it'd be important to speak with Linda Burney who's the shadow spokesperson for the Federal Labor Party on this issue but many other issues. She's really in all of the social affairs spaces. Uh, Linda Burney joins me now. Linda Burney, welcome to the program. Hi Patricia. Post Gama, we were both there. We spent some time <laughs> together. I've got to say thank you for the lift. Uh, now, do you now believe this promise on constitutional recognition will be delivered? Is it going to be delivered in the next three years? I think your introduction was absolutely correct. Uh, constitutional recognition by far and away dominated almost or came into almost every aspect of Gama. Um, if I were the Prime Minister, I would be seizing this opportunity with both hands and looking at, at, looking at it as an amazing legacy. There is no doubt in my mind, Patricia, that constitutional recognition is going to dominate the political agenda in this term of government. Uh, Labor has made, as you know, a solid commitment to the government to work as collaboratively as possible. Um, and what seems to be the sticking point at the moment is that Indigenous people and the Labor Party are saying clearly they want constitutional recognition of a voice to the Parliament and the Prime Minister is saying he will have recognition in the Constitution but not a constitutionally enshrined voice to the Parliament. That's the divide we need to, uh, we need to overcome. So who shifts here? Does a compromise need to be found? Does it mean that not only the government needs to shift but perhaps uh, Indigenous Australians? How do you view it? Well, the reason the Constitution, and I know that I'm not telling you everything, so just to explain to our viewers, the reason the constitutional enshrinement of a voice is so important to First Nations people is it because it provides permanency, it provides certainty. Um, whilst ATSIC was disbanded 20 years ago, it is still very much um, a sting for Aboriginal people that the, that the voice, the elected voice of Aboriginal people was disbanded at the whim of a government. And that's what uh, the Uluru star statement wants to avoid that kind of repeat and that's why the Constitution is so important. I don't think that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders are going to move away from that and it seems to me that uh, that when and as Anthony Albanese said that everyone's worried about it and when it's done everyone will say well what what was the the big fuss about. I think that the uh, Prime Minister and I hope with an open mind and an open heart will actually see the sense of an enshrined voice, that it's not a threat, that it's advisory, and it's actually up to the parliament to um, agree to the final design of the voice. And if the Prime Minister doesn't take that challenge that you've um, now set him in three years, should it be set aside? Is no. something better than nothing? Or, I mean, presumably, if you don't think a compromise can be come to, you think it's not worth going to referendum? I, I think that, that we'll come to a landing on this. I truly do. I mean, uh, in the words of the late Faith Bandler, this is, this is a long game. It's been going on for, you know, ever since the 30s, this kind of voice for, uh, this call for Aboriginal representation um, in decisions that affect Aboriginal people. It's not a new thing at all. 
and there are not quick answers. But tr Patricia, I truly believe that we can get to a point uh, after the co-design process, which has to happen, uh, we can get to a point uh, where uh, there is going to be the realisation of what the Uluru Statement says. I truly believe that that's possible. The Othu Yindi Foundation Chair Denise Bowden said money is being spent in Darwin, being taken away from remote communities. She provided examples, mm. she provided figures in a pretty searing speech. Is this something that Federal Labor will investigate? Uh, well, it was a very searing speech and I don't particularly want to get into what the local politics that were obviously being played out um, at the time. But it is true that de what Denise is saying is that many, much of the GST dollars that go into the Northern Territory uh, are, are, are because of uh, the Aboriginal population and the remoteness. Um, I do believe the Northern Territory Government is putting um, a, money, a lot of money into remote communities as well as the Commonwealth. But what I will say to you, Patricia, is what the Labor Party wants to investigate and has been trying to investigate is what on earth is going on at the federal level with the Indigenous Advancement Strategy money. It's opaque, uh, there is no accountability and it's worth billions of dollars and who knows how decisions have been made about the expenditure of that money, much of it in the Northern Territory. And what commitments have you got from Ken White, who's now the new minister, about transparency around that funding? Well, Labor went into the election, which uh, we lost, of course, uh, uh, with a commitment to uh, restructure the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. I've had a very brief discussion with Ken, um, and he's very committed to getting it straightened out, I believe. But there needs to be public accountability on how the decisions were made, particularly towards the end of the last term of government and how much money was pushed out the door without proper scrutiny and I believe um, some questionable processes. Uh, I, I could be wrong but it just seemed to me that if the Parliamentary Budget Office could not tell us uh, what was happening in the IAS um, bucket then there is some questions that need to be answered. Just on another issue, your Labor colleague Ed Husick has said today that Australia should have been asking questions at these Osmin talks, and of course they're the meetings that, we, that were had earlier this week between uh, Australia and the United States, about what the United States is doing to fight the rise of white supremacy and terrorism. He thinks that should have been raised in that forum. Do you agree? Look, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen or heard what Ed has exactly said um, in relation to that, but clearly uh, this is a major issue in the United States, given those two terrible tragedies that happened within a 24-hour period um, in Iowa and in Texas. But what I can tell you for sure, Patricia, is that um, our own country has its own issues. I was down on the south coast uh, before the election campaigning with Leanne Atkinson, who was the Labor Party candidate for the far south coast. I was down there with Mike and Shelley, um, uh, Mike and Shelley Kelly, uh, Mike Kelly of course being a member of parliament, Shelley his wife who is Jewish, and some of the most obnoxious um, stickers were put on Mike's door. Uh, were put on the Welcome to Refugees sign that we were down there at the community centre and I was just speaking to Leanne that says it's all happened over again. Um, I'm not saying Australia's got the same issues as the United States but we should be not naive enough to think that there are not elements of such actions in this country. Are you concerned that our own agencies aren't focusing enough on the rise of white supremacy? I'm not concerned about that, no. I think it's very much in the sights of our own agencies. But what I am saying is that we as a community, um, both in the parliamentary sense as well as the, uh, the broader community sense, should not think that we don't have some of the same elements in Australia. You only have to think back, Patricia, to 2005 and think of the Cronulla riots just to understand how much this is just below the surface in Australia. 
Linda Burney, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that's Labor's Indigenous Affairs spokeswoman, Linda Burney. And I will return again right next to you tomorrow. Sounds good. Thanks for that, PK. See ya. Australia's Olympic gold medalist to hurdler Sally Pearson says she is retiring less than a year out from the 2020 Tokyo Games. The athletic star has cited persistent injury problems as her main reason for stepping off the track. Sports editor David Marks spoke to Pearson about her incredible career and what the future holds. Sally Pearson, they say you're a long time retired. What are your emotions right now? What's, what's swirling around in your head? Um, I'm feeling sad, but also confident in my decision that this is the right decision that I've made. Um, it's disappointing my body couldn't handle anymore because my mind certainly wants to keep going. Um, but I want to be happy as well. I don't want to be hobbling off the track in my retirement. I want to be able to choose when it was the right time for me is. Just several weeks ago, you were helping launch Australia's uh, one year out from the Olympics. Um, celebration I suppose um, and at that time you were talking about competing so what changed in that period? Another injury changed, <laughs> injuries happen so quickly and sometimes you can't prevent them from coming and you don't know when they're going to come so yeah it's unfortunate that I was so excited for the year to go and then a, a week later the Achilles started to flare up again so it's just one after the other after the other and there's only so much I could take. When you look back on your career you've got an Olympic gold and, and two world championships which of those really stand out to you? Um, obviously the London Olympics was huge for me, that was, that's very special to me, that's the pinnacle of my sport. But then also coming back for my second world title in 2017 was just as special, it was a very proud moment for me after you know, a couple of years of really bad injuries and then coaching myself